Chapters 4 through 6 of Irenaeus Against Heresies, Book 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Irenaeus Against Heresies, Book 1. Translated by Alexander Roberts and William H. Rombo. Chapter 4. Account given by the heretics of the formation of Achimoth, origin of the visible world from her disturbances. 1. The following are the transactions which they narrate as having occurred outside of the Pleroma. The Enthymesis of that Sophia who dwells above, which they also term Achimoth, being removed from the Pleroma together with her passion. They relate to have, as a matter of course, become violently excited in those places of darkness and vacuity to which she had been banished. For she was excluded from light and the pleroma, and was without form or figure like an untimely birth, because she had received nothing from a male parent. But the Christ dwelling on high took pity upon her, and having extended himself through and beyond Staros, he imparted a figure to her, but merely as respected substance, and not so as to convey intelligence. Having effected this, he withdrew his influence, and returned, leaving Achimoth to herself, in order that she, becoming sensible of her suffering as being severed from the Pleroma, might be influenced by the desire of better things, while she possessed in the meantime a kind of odor of immortality left in her by Christ and the Holy Spirit. Wherefore also she is called by two names, Sophia after her father, for Sophia is spoken of as being her father, and Holy Spirit from that Spirit who is along with Christ. Having then obtained a form along with intelligence, and being immediately deserted by that Lagos who had been invisibly present with her, that is, by Christ, she strained herself to discover that light which had forsaken her, but could not affect her purpose inasmuch as she was prevented by Horos. And as Horos thus obstructed her further progress, he exclaimed, Io, whence they say this name Io derived its origin. And when she could not pass by Horos, on account of that passion in which she had been involved, and because she alone had been left without, she then resigned herself to every sort of that manifold and varied state of passion to which she was subject, and thus she suffered grief on the one hand because she had not obtained the object of her desire, and fear on the other hand, lest life itself should fail her as light had already done while, in addition, she was in the greatest perplexity. All these feelings were associated with ignorance, and this ignorance of hers was not, like that of her mother, the first Sophia, an Ion, due to degeneracy by means of passion, but to an innate opposition of nature to knowledge. Moreover, another kind of passion fell upon her, namely, that of desiring to return to him who gave her life. 2. This collection of passions, they declare, was the substance of the matter from which this world was formed. For, from her desire of returning to him who gave her life, every soul belonging to this world, and that of the demiurge himself, derived its origin. All other things owed their beginning to her terror and sorrow. For, from her tears, all that is of a liquid nature was formed. From her smile, all that is lucent. And from her grief and perplexity, all the corporeal elements of the world. For at one time, as they affirm, she would weep and lament on account of being left alone in the midst of darkness and vacuity while, at another time, reflecting on the light which had forsaken her, she would be filled with joy and laugh, then again she would be struck with terror, or at other times would sink into consternation and bewilderment. 3. 
Now what follows from all this? No light tragedy comes out of it, as the fancy of every man among them pompously explains, one in one way and another in another, from what kind of passion and from what element being derived its origin. They have good reason, it seems to me, why they should not feel inclined to teach these things at all in public, but only to such as are able to pay a high price for an acquaintance with such profound mysteries. For these doctrines are not at all similar to those of which our Lord said, Freely ye have received, freely give. They are, on the contrary, abstruse and portentous and profound mysteries, to be got at only with great labor by such as are in love with falsehood. For who would not expend all that he possessed, if only he might learn in return that from the tears of the enthemesis of the Ion, involved in passion, seas and fountains and rivers, and every liquid substance derived its origin, that light burst forth from her smile, and that from her perplexity and consternation the corporeal elements of the world had their formation. 4. I feel somewhat inclined myself to contribute a few hints towards the development of their system. For when I perceive that waters are in part fresh, such as fountains, rivers, showers, and so on, and in part salt, such as those in the sea, I reflect with myself that all such waters cannot be derived from her tears, inasmuch as these are of a saline quality only. It is clear, therefore, that the waters which are salt are alone those which are derived from her tears. But it is probable that she, in her intense agony and perplexity, was covered with perspiration, and hence, following out their notion, we may conceive that fountains and rivers and all the fresh water in the world are due to this source. For it is difficult, since we know that all tears are of the same quality, to believe that waters, both salt and fresh, proceeded from them. The more plausible supposition is that some are from her tears and some from her perspiration, and since there are also in the world certain waters which are hot and acrid in their nature, thou must be left to guess their origin, how and whence. Such are some of the results of their hypothesis. 5. They go on to state that, when the mother Achimoth had passed through all sorts of passion, and had with difficulty escaped from them, she turned herself to supplicate the light which had forsaken her, that is, Christ. He, however, having returned to the Pleroma, and being probably unwilling again to descend from it, sent forth to her the paraclete, that is, the Saviour. This being was endowed with all power by the Father, who placed everything under his authority, the Ions doing likewise, so that by him were all things, visible and invisible, created, thrones, divinities, dominions. He then was sent to her along with his contemporary angels, and they relate that Achimoth, filled with reverence, at first veiled herself through modesty, but that, by and by, when she had looked upon him with all his endowments, and had acquired strength from his appearance, she ran forward to meet him. He then imparted to her form as respected intelligence, and brought healing to her passions, separating them from her, but not so as to drive them out of thought altogether. For it was not possible that they should be annihilated as in the former case, because they had already taken root and acquired strength, so as to possess an indestructible existence. All that he could do was to separate them and set them apart, and then commingle and condense them, so as to transmute them from incorporeal passion into unorganized matter. He then by this process conferred upon them a fitness and a nature to become concretions and corporeal structures, in order that the two substances should be formed, 
the one evil resulting from the passions, and the other subject indeed to suffering, but originating from her conversion. And on this account, i.e., on account of this hypostasizing of ideal matter, they say that the Saviour virtually created the world. But when Achimoth was freed from her passion, she gazed with rapture on the dazzling vision of the angels that were with him, and in her ecstasy, conceiving by them, they tell us that she brought forth new beings, partly after her own image, and partly a spiritual progeny after the image of the Saviour's attendants. Chapter 5 Formation of the Demiurge Description of Him He is the Creator of everything outside of the Pleroma. 1. These three kinds of existence, then, having according to them being now formed, one from the passion, which was matter, a second from the conversion, which was animal, and a third, that which she, Achimoth, herself brought forth, which was spiritual, she next addressed herself to the task of giving these form. But she could not succeed in doing this, as respected the spiritual existence, because it was of the same nature with herself. She therefore applied herself to give form to the animal substance which had proceeded from her own conversion, and to bring forth to light the instructions of the Saviour. And they say she first formed out of the animal substance him who was father and king of all things, both of these which are of the same nature with himself, that is, animal substances, which they also call right-handed, and those which spring from the passion and from matter, which they call left-handed. For they affirm that he formed all the things which came into existence after him, being secretly impelled thereto by his mother, from this circumstance they style him Metropator, Apator, Demiurge, and Father, saying that he is father of the substances on the right hand, that is, of the animal, but Demiurge of those on the left, that is, of the material, while he is at the same time the king of all. For they say that this enthemesis, desirous of making all things to the honor of the Ions, formed images of them, or rather that the Saviour did so through her instrumentality. And she, in the image of the Invisible Father, kept herself concealed from the Demiurge. But he was in the image of the Only Begotten Son, and the angels and archangels created by him were in the image of the rest of the Ions. 2. They affirm, therefore, that he was constituted the Father and God of everything outside of the Pleroma, being the creator of all animal and material substances. For he it was that discriminated these two kinds of existence hitherto confused, and made corporeal from incorporeal substances, fashioned things heavenly and earthly, and became framer, that is, demiurge, of things material and animal, of those on the right and those on the left, of the light and of the heavy, and of those tending upwards as well as those tending downwards. He created also seven heavens, above which they say that he, the demiurge, exists. And on this account they term him Hebdomas, and his mother Achimoth Ogdoas, preserving the number of the first begotten and primary Ogdoad of the Pleroma. They affirm, moreover, that these seven heavens are intelligent, and speak of them as being angels, while they refer to the Demiurge himself as being an angel bearing a likeness to God. And in the same strain, they declare that Paradise, situated above the third heaven, is a fourth angel possessed of power, from whom Adam derived certain qualities while he conversed with him. 3. They go on to say that the Demiurge imagined that he created all these things of himself, 
while he in reality made them in conjunction with the productive power of Achamoth. He formed the heavens, yet was ignorant of the heavens. He fashioned man, yet knew not man. He brought to light the earth, yet had no acquaintance with the earth. And, in like manner, they declare that he was ignorant of the forms of all that he made, and knew not even of the existence of his own mother, but imagined that he himself was all things. They further affirm that his mother originated this opinion in his mind, because she desired to bring him forth possessed of such a character that he should be the head and source of his own essence, and the absolute ruler over every kind of operation that was afterwards attempted. His mother they also call Ogdoad, Sophia, Terra, Jerusalem, Holy Spirit, and with a masculine reference, Lord. Her place of habitation is an indeterminate one, above the demiurge indeed, but below and outside of the pleroma, even to the end. 4. As then, they represent all material substance to be formed from three passions, these fear, grief, and perplexity, the account they give is as follows. Animal substances originated from fear and from conversion. The demiurge they also describe as owing his origin to conversion. But the existence of all other animal substances they ascribe to fear, such as the souls of irrational animals and of wild beasts and men. And on this account he, that is, the demiurge, being incapable of recognizing any spiritual essences, imagined himself to be God alone, and declared through the prophets, I am God, and besides me there is none else. They further teach that the spirits of wickedness derived their origin from grief. Hence the devil, whom they also call Cosmocrator, that is, the ruler of the world, and the demons, and the angels, and every wicked spiritual being that exists, found the source of their existence. They represent the Demiurge as being the son of that mother of theirs, that is, Achamoth, and Cosmocrator as the creature of the Demiurge. Cosmocrator has knowledge of what is above himself, because he is a spirit of wickedness. But the Demiurge is ignorant of such things, inasmuch as he is merely animal. Their mother dwells in that place which is above the heavens, that is, in the intermediate abode. The Demiurge in the heavenly place, that is, in the Hebdomad, but the Cosmocrator in this, our world. The corporeal elements of this world again sprang, as we before remarked, from bewilderment and perplexity, as from a more ignoble source. Thus the earth arose from her state of stupor, water from the agitation caused by her fear, air from the consolidation of her grief, while fire, producing death and corruption, was inherent in all these elements, even as they teach that ignorance also lay concealed in these three passions. 5. Having thus formed the world, he, that is the demiurge, also created the earthly part of man, not taking him from his dry earth, but from an invisible substance consisting of fusible and fluid matter, and then afterwards, as they define the process, breathed into him the animal part of his nature. It was the latter which was created after his image and likeness. The material part, indeed, was very near to God, so far as the image went, but not of the same substance with him. The animal, on the other hand, was so in respect to likeness, and hence his substance was called the spirit of life, because it took its rise from a spiritual outflowing. After all this, he was, they say, enveloped all round with a covering of skin, and by this they mean the outward sensitive flesh. 
6. But they further affirm that the Demiurge himself was ignorant of that offspring of his mother Achimoth, which she brought forth as a consequence of her contemplation of those angels who waited on the Saviour, and which was, like herself, of a spiritual nature. She took advantage of this ignorance to deposit it in him without his knowledge, in order that, being by his instrumentality infused into that animal soul proceeding from himself, and being thus carried as in a womb in this material body, while it gradually increased in strength, might in course of time become fitted for the reception of perfect rationality. Thus it came to pass, then, according to them, that without any knowledge on the part of the Demiurge, the man formed by his inspiration was at the same time, through an unspeakable providence, rendered a spiritual man by the simultaneous inspiration received from Sophia. For as he was ignorant of his mother, so neither did he recognize her offspring. This offspring they also declare to be the Ecclesia, an emblem of the Ecclesia which is above. This, then, is the kind of man whom they conceive of. He has his animal soul from the Demiurge, his body from the earth, his fleshly part from matter, and his spiritual part from the mother Achimoth. Chapter 6 The Threefold Kind of Man Feigned by These Heretics Good Works Needless for Them, Though Necessary to Others Their Abandoned Morals 1. There being thus three kinds of substances, they declare of all that is material, which they also describe as being on the left hand, that it must of necessity perish, inasmuch as it is incapable of receiving any inflatus of incorruption. As to every animal existence, which they also denominate on the right hand, they hold that, inasmuch as it is a mean between the spiritual and the material, it passes to the side to which inclination draws it. Spiritual substance, again, they describe as having been sent forth for this end, that, being here united with that which is animal, it might assume shape, the two elements being simultaneously subjected to the same discipline. And this they declare to be the salt, and the light of the world. For the animal substance has need of training by means of the outward senses, and on this account they affirm that the world was created, as well as that the Saviour came to the animal substance, which was possessed of free will, that he might secure for it salvation. For they affirm that he received the first fruits of those whom he was to save, as follows, from Achimoth, that was the spiritual, while he was invested by the Demiurge with the animal Christ, but was beget by a special dispensation with a body endowed with an animal nature, yet constructed with unspeakable skill, so that it might be visible and tangible and capable of enduring suffering. At the same time, they deny that he assumed anything material unto his nature since indeed matter is incapable of salvation. They further hold that the consummation of all things will take place when all that is spiritual has been formed and perfected by gnosis, that is, knowledge. And by this they mean spiritual men who have attained to the perfect knowledge of God and been initiated into these mysteries by Achimoth and they represent themselves to be these persons. 2. Animal men, again, are instructed in animal things. Such men, namely, as are established by their works, and by a mere faith, while they have not perfect knowledge. We of the church, they say, are these persons. Wherefore also they maintain that good works are necessary to us, for that otherwise it is impossible we should be saved. But as to themselves, 
they hold that they shall be entirely and undoubtedly saved, not by means of conduct, but because they are spiritual in nature. For just as it is impossible that material substance should partake of salvation, since indeed they maintain that it is incapable of receiving it, so again it is impossible that spiritual substance, by which they mean themselves, should ever come under the power of corruption, whatever the sort of actions in which they indulged. For even as gold, when submersed in filth, loses not on that account its beauty, but retains its own native qualities, the filth having no power to injure the gold, so they affirm that they cannot in any measure suffer hurt, or lose their spiritual substance, whatever the material actions in which they may be involved. 3. Wherefore also it comes to pass, that the most perfect among them addict themselves without fear to all kinds of forbidden deeds of which the scriptures assures us that they who do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. For instance, they make no scruple about eating meats offered in sacrifice to idols, imagining that they can in this way contract no defilement. Then again, at every heathen festival celebrated in honor of the idols, these men are the first to assemble, and to such a pitch do they go, that some of them do not even keep away from that bloody spectacle, hateful both to God and men, in which gladiators either fight with wild beasts, or singly encounter one another. Others of them yield themselves up to the lusts of the flesh, with the utmost greediness, maintaining that carnal things should be allowed to the carnal nature, while the spiritual things are provided for the spiritual. Some of them, moreover, are in the habit of defiling those women to whom they have taught the above doctrine, as has frequently been confessed by those women who have been led astray by certain of them. On their returning to the Church of God, and acknowledging this along with the rest of their errors. But of them, too, openly and without a blush, having become passionately attached to certain women, seduce them away from their husbands, and contract marriages of their own with them. Others of them, again, who pretend at first to live in all modesty with them as with sisters, have in course of time been revealed in their true colors when the sister has been found with child by her pretended brother. 4. And committing many other abominations and impieties, they run us down, who from the fear of God guard against sinning even in thought or word, as utterly contemptible and ignorant persons, while they highly exalt themselves and claim to be perfect and the elect seed. For they declare that we simply receive grace for use, wherefore also it will again be taken away from us, but that they themselves have grace as their own special possession which has descended from above by means of an unspeakable and indescribable conjunction, and on this account more will be given them. They maintain, therefore, that in every way it is always necessary for them to practice the mystery of conjunction, and that they may persuade the thoughtless to believe this, they are in the habit of using these very words, Whosoever being in this world does not so love a woman as to obtain possession of her, is not of the truth, nor shall attain the truth. But whosoever being of this world has intercourse with woman, shall not attain the truth, because he has acted under the power of concupiscence. On this account they tell us that it is necessary for us whom they call animal men, and describe as being of the world, to practice continence and good works, that by this means we may attain at length to the intermediate habitation, but that to them, who are called the spiritual and perfect, such a course of conduct is not at all necessary. 
for it is not conduct of any kind which leads into the pleroma, but the seed sent forth thence in a feeble, immature state, and here brought to perfection. End of Book 1, Chapters 4 through 6